Good morning and welcome to Highway Online. It's a joy and a privilege to be with you today. We trust today's message will be an encouragement to you in your walk of faith. If you live in the uh, Sydney or Peninsula area, or perhaps you are visiting, we welcome you to our in-person service every Sunday at 1030. We are located at 10364 McDonald Park Road in Sydney. We are right in between the airport and the ferry right off the Patricia Bay Highway. If you would like more information concerning our church, connect with us at hcfsydney.ca and someone would be happy to uh, share with you, to pray with you, and you'll find all of our ministries right there. Just follow the links. God bless and let's enjoy today's message. team this morning. Didn't they do an awesome job today? Aren't we thankful for those that God has graced us with? And we're so thankful for all the talent and all the gifts that God has given us in this congregation from the very moment that we walked through this door. We were greeted and uh, we felt the love uh, of the God's people and the presence of the Lord together. It is a great time and a great place to be together. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, uh, I greet you in the name of the Lord. I'm Pastor Ralph for those who are our guests this morning. And uh, I'm also one of the pastors here at Highway. And it's my joy to be able to share God's word with you. If you are a first time guest, we invite you to uh, take the connect card that's in the seat uh, before you or around you to fill that out and put it in the offering box a, a little later after the service. Or if you have a prayer request, you can write that down as well. And uh, we are here to serve, we are here to pray, we are here together to glorify God. Well, listen, if you've got your Bibles or your electronic device, or you could reach for a Bible that's in the seat uh, before you or underneath you, I'd invite you to turn with me, please, to the New Testament, to the book, short little letter of Colossians, one of Paul's um, shorter letters, and uh, we're going to read together from Colossians chapter 1 as we actually conclude our series, Can You Hear Me Now? Can You Hear Me Now? And this has been a great series for me to be able to preach and to teach, and I want to thank you for all of the comments that uh, I have received via email or personally of how God has blessed you through this series. Today we're going to conclude this series, and the title of my message today is Hearing God Without Being Weird. How many know you can hear God and you don't have to be weird? And it, the word doesn't have to be weird. Well, let's just read together, and I'm going to start at verse 3 of chapter 1 of Colossians. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been during, uh, doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. And verse 9 is where I want to, to jumpstart today. This is the primary verse for us today. For this reason, for what reason? For every reason that he's just given in the first eight verses. He gives thanks to God for their faith, for their hope, for the hope they have in Christ and the love that they share. He gives thanks for their pastor, Epaphras. He gives thanks for their servant heart. He gives thanks for their faithfulness. For all of this, for, all, for this reason, Paul says, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped 
praying for you. Oh, to be like the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine having the Apostle Paul praying for you? Continuously, even while he was in prison, not thinking of himself, not thinking about his own circumstances, not praying for his own deliverance, but as he is praying, he's praying constantly for the church. And folk, I believe there's an important lesson here for us today. As we recall and remember and recite all that God has for us, we can be thankful. We can be joy-filled. The word that I felt Holy Spirit putting in my heart today was that this would be a day of joy. This would be a day of joyfulness for transferring the the spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise. God wants us to be thankful, and he wants us and calls us to be prayerful. He says, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God. Notice what what his prayer request is for the believers. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Through all the wisdom and in and through all wisdom uh, that the Spirit gives. Why? So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us today. Father, thank you for your word. Now, Lord, I thank you you're going to speak to us as I endeavor to preach this word, to teach your word. May our ears be open and ready to hear it. May our eyes be open to see the way you would have us to go. And Lord, may we be ready to respond to your call today in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor George Truett, once said, the greatest knowledge is to know God's will. The greatest work is to do God's will. Success is knowing God's will and being right in the center of it. I think that's something worthy to say amen to. When we follow God's will for our lives, when we hear him speak, when we dear dare ask, God, speak to me. Reveal to me the the direction that you would have me to go, if it's to university, to medical school, to be a radiologist, or to be a car mechanic, whatever it is, God, show me. Because what I want to do more than anything is to have you show through me. And one of the most important things we can do as followers of Jesus is not just to ask for his direction and will, but to follow his will for his life. And God has a plan for each and every one of you. For all the young people, God not only has a plan for you, but he has a plan for every mom and dad and grandma and grandpa that is here today and that is watching online. He has a plan for you. Paul prayed that the believers would have a knowledge of his will. We can know God's will. We can know his voice. He wants to inform us through true spiritual understanding. To know his will is to be led and guided by his spirit. To know God and what he requires of us is our first responsibility. And the purpose for this prayer, Paul says, is so that we may walk worthy of the Lord. Not to make a million dollars, not to build a bigger house, not to build a bigger church, not to fill the coffers, not to give more to missions. No, he calls us to know his will. He calls us to hear his voice so that we may walk worthy of of him to please him in everything we do and everywhere we go. And here's the rub, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the key, young people. It's that we would do so in balance. For the last several weeks, we have been talking about how God wants to speak to us and why it's important that we hear from God. 
And maybe it sounds strange, but yes, God's word says you can hear from God. We need to hear from God. God wants to speak to you and I. We can hear God because his spirit is active and his word is alive today. We know his word as we read it and as we hear his voice, we are made ready to fulfill his will. He speaks to us in extraordinary ways and ordinary ways. Oftentimes we get stuck waiting for that extraordinary way that God's going to speak to us. The voice from the heavens, the, the, the parting of an ocean, something dramatic. But God is speaking through ordinary ways each and every day we walk before him. So don't discount the ordinary. And as you walk before him, as you listen to his voice... Understand that as he directs you, his directions also come with expectations. You see, as we studied last week, there are six steps to hearing and walking in God's will. First of all, it begins with submitting to his will. This is where it all begins, ladies and gentlemen. If we fail here, nothing else is going to matter. We begin by submitting ourselves to his will by and then receiving a word from him. This is the what. What is God saying to us? And when we receive a word from him, maybe it's a word of direction, we, work, we look to confirm that word by asking God to reveal his process. Yes, God has a process. He has order. He has uh, a direction that he wants to give us. And as we are looking for God to reveal his process, we wait for his divine timing to act. And this is the other area that we have a hard time with, isn't it? We want to hear the word now, and we want to go right now. But God calls us often to wait. And when we submit, we receive the word, we confirm the word, we wait for him to reveal his process, and we wait for his timing. When all of that comes into place, then we walk in obedience. Well, how do we confirm that word? Again, let me very quickly give you the nine tests to confirm God speak, what God is saying to you and directing you. Number one, we ask, does this violate biblical principles? In one of our messages, we learned that the primary way God speaks is through his word. Secondly, we ask, what is the tone of the word or the message that I'm receiving? Is it a word of teaching? Is it a word of correction? Is it a word of exhortation? Or is it a word of condemnation? Ask yourself, if this word is recurring, does, it, does this message keep coming up? How does it keep coming up? Is it, con do, can, is it something you just can't get out of your mind or your heart? And there may be a sensation or a feeling, but please be warned that no feeling we have can be the final judgment. And so we need to ask God for a sign that follows his biblical principles. And then we look for wise advice and counsel as we receive confirmation from others concerning this word. How about the circumstances? Maybe Are the circumstances pointing you in this direction? And if you receive something, have you received something that you've already asked for? Here's the point. God wants to speak. He will speak. Are you listening? And this is what I want us to hear today. Not only does God speak to you, but you can hear God without it being weird. What do I mean by being weird? Perhaps some of you may be wondering where the line is concerning what we should be going to God for in terms of his guidance and what we should not need to go to God for. 
for example, a college student who was used to having his mother always set out his clothes every morning, was getting ready for his first day of classes and wanted to look just right. He prayed what jeans he should wear when he heard a voice saying, choose your own jeans, I'm your father, not your mother. Psalm 32, 8 and 9 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding, but must be controlled by the bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. God says he will lead us, he will teach us, but we need to be careful that we are pliable and that we, have a, that we are teachable to understand what it is he's saying and what it will entail in changing us. Hearing God is important. He will speak. He wants to speak. Are we listening to him? How do we know we're hearing him? Let me share with you as we conclude this series with four principles of dif discerning God's voice. Number one, hearing God must never replace the word of God. Today, all over Vancouver Island, there are not just hundreds, but thousands of people gathered in churches like ours, hearing the word being expounded. Sadly, yet tru truthfully, in many of these churches, many of these people, it is the only time during the week that they ever open a Bible or turn on their Bible app. My friend, I don't have to say it over again, but it bears repeating that if we are going to go to God for guidance, then we must personally be in his word each and every day that we can. Many I, people I hear say, Lord, Pastor, I've had a rhema word from God. I believe he's speaking to me. But my message to them is always this, that God's rhema word will, must always be balanced by his logos word. As we learned a few weeks ago, God will never directly tell you to do anything that contradicts what he has already told you in the Bible. The Bible is God's final authority and the primary way that God speaks. We do not have to ask if it's his will to commit adultery. He says no. We don't have to ask his will if it's okay to fudge the books at work. He says no. We don't have to ask God if it's okay to drive over the speed limit. The answer is clearly no. And if you feel led today to do something that the Bible declares is wrong, then I can guarantee you it's not God telling you to do it. There are many things that God has laid out in his word that give us direction. And these things are black and white. The problem often is that we simply don't want to read it. Psalm 119, 24 David writes, your laws please me. They give me wise advice. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Notice what it says. It says here, all scripture is inspired. All scripture is useful. All scripture from Genesis to Revelation is God's word to us. We do not have to pick and choose the parts that we like or don't like because that's often what we end up doing. Kind of like the young man that you've probably heard of that was praying for God's will. And so he was looking through the word of God and he was saying, God, let me open the word and whatever verse I put my hands on, I will do it. And so he opened his word and said, Judas went and hanged himself. He says, God, that can't be your will. So he closed his Bible again, 
prayed, opened it up, put it on his finger, and it said, go and do thou likewise. Yeah, I know that's an old one, but it still makes the point. You know, one of the most dangerous things I've heard in recent years is from some foremost TV preachers, megachurch pastors, who have said things to the effect, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. The thought being that as New Testament believers, we must not become involved or enmeshed in the Old. It's good for examples, it's good for poetry, but it doesn't give us what, we, that, what the New Testament is given. But I would like to say to these preachers, I would like to say to everyone that as far as your pastor is concerned, our conviction as a church, as a fellowship, and what your pastor believes and preaches is that all Scripture is God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. Joshua 1 8 says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. God is calling us to be people of the book. He's calling us to be people. If we want to know his voice, it begins with knowing his word. Oh, Pastor, I have the Spirit. The Spirit just tells me everything. Hallelujah. I pray that every person within the sound of my voice will know and experience the power and blessing of being filled with the Spirit. But I want you to hear these words by R.T. Kendall. If you have the Word without the Spirit, you tend to dry up. If you have the Spirit without the Word, you tend to blow up. However, if you have both the Spirit and the Word, you tend to grow up. We need balance in hearing God. The first way we find that balance is by, is by being students of God's Word. Secondly, we, hearing God means using common sense. We don't hear a lot about common sense these days. I look at social media, I look at the news at night, and I'm going, where has common sense gone? How many are with me? Where has it gone? People accuse Christians of leaving their brains at the door, but nothing could ever be further from the pr truth. Lenny and young people, I want you to know when you Go to university. If that's where God leads you, I want you to understand something. The most intellectual book you could ever read is this one right here. It's more than a book of wonderful stories and rules of do's and don'ts and commands and biographies of names you can't pronounce. But you can read this book with confidence, knowing it's God's word. It has been tested, it has been tried, and it has been proven true time and time and time again. But as you study God's word, don't forget the two by four that God has also blessed you with. What is common sense? Common sense is an understanding simply of how life works, often discovered through experience. And oftentimes that experience and knowledge is learned the hard way. Such as when I was eight years old and climbed the, an the TV antenna tower attached to the side of our house to climb onto the roof wearing a red cape thinking I could defy gravity. And guess what? Wearing a red tape, cape does not mean you can fly. It means you can fall flat on your mother's rose bushes. But it's one thing for a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, even a 16-year-old, my friends today, God help us as we learn his word that we walk in his ways using the common sense that he has 
given to us. The Bible tells us that there are, that there are things that we can expect to happen when we use common sense. There are examples of common sense. For example, hard work will yield better results than laziness. Treating others well will generally result in being treated well yourself. Financial poor management leads to poverty. Exposing your sin to the sun for lengthy periods of time will damage your skin and may cause cancer. Too much alcohol consumption will lead to addiction. These are common sense. It's called common sense because it's a truth understood by most of us through a period of long observation. When I was a teenager, I didn't think anyone over the age of 30 knew anything. Especially my parents or my grandparents. My youth pastor, I gave him a pass. And then I became 30. And I wondered, where did all the knowledge I learned go to? And then I became 40 and 50. And we have all here in this room achieved that place, wondering, when am I ever going to learn? Well, guess what? God's still teaching us. And that's why Proverbs 24, 32 says, I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. My friends, learning common sense, learning God's way does not end at an altar or the graduation from a university or Bible college or seminary. No, it is a lifelong experience. I like what my father-in-law used to say. My father-in-law never went to college or university, and he would always say, yep, I graduated, I graduated with a Ph.D. in life. And you know what? He was one of the wisest, most well-read, biblically literate men I ever knew because he continued to learn. He continued to read God's word. He continued to to learn from both his successes and his mistakes. Proverbs 3, 21 to 23 says, My son, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. We need to be students of God's word. We may need to use common sense. And let me just back up here for a second. Because I have been asked, uh, I've been asked a question that I used to ask my youth pastor and senior pastor as a teenager. Pastor, how can I know? How can I really, really know? Well, I think these six things are applicable not just to youth, but to each and every one of us. If you're wanting to know what God wants you to do, maybe it's in the church, maybe it's following retirement, maybe it's uh, following graduation from high school, whatever it is, ask yourself this question, what are the things that you like to do? You know, I grew up with a very twisted, perverted idea of knowing God's will. I used to think that God's will meant that he wanted me to do something I hated. But the fact of the matter is, if there is something you like and that you are good at, follow that desire. Secondly, what is it that you are able to do? What are you able to do? What are the giftings and the talents that God has already given you? And find a place to serve there. What are the things that the Bible has given you permission to do what are that which is not going to compromise your moral stand what are the things you can earn a living at that's something that every dad and every prospective father-in-law wants to ask their children and 
in-laws, like the dad who was sitting in front of his uh, son and his, his daughter and her fiancé, and the dad was quite wealthy and had worked hard for his money and asked the son, son-in-law, well, what do you plan to do with your life, son? And the young man with excitement said, well, I love your daughter, sir. I will give I will climb the highest mountain for her. I will do anything for her. I will, I, 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 I will do whatever I can for her. And afterwards, the husband and wife were talking, and the wife asked the husband, well, how did it go? He says, oh, it went fine. I learned that I'm going to be supporting them the rest of our lives. <laughs> what are the things that you can make a living at? What are the things that feel, that feel important and that can make an impact in the world? And what are the things that build God's kingdom? Where can you be a witness? I challenge you, everyone, young people especially, to ask yourself these questions. As you're seeking God for his direction, put these down. Make them a matter of prayer. We need to be students of God's word. We need to use our common sense. And thirdly, hearing God means seeking the counsel of others. Hearing God's voice does not mean that we shut down our mind and just blindly obey something that may or may not be true. It's important that we confirm his voice by seeking the counsel and con- confirmation of those that, you, that, tre- that love you enough to tell you that you're crazy. Oftentimes, we're like Solomon's son, Rehoboam. When he was presented with the question, what was he going to do? What kind of a ruler would he be? And the elders came to him and said to do this and the people will love you. And his young friends who had no interests but self-interests told the king otherwise. And he went with the words of his friends and it ended up dividing the country. If you're going to seek counsel from others, seek it from people whom you trust to know God, to know God's word, whether it's a pastor, an elder, a family relative, that it be someone, a friend who knows God, but loves and respects you enough that will not just agree with you, but will love you enough to maybe even say you're nuts. You're wrong. You're going to be heading down a road of destruction. Can I tell you a story? I guess I will anyway. Some time ago, before I started dating Sue, I was dating another young lady in our college and career group. Beautiful young lady. She loved the Lord with all of her heart. She was passionate for God. And she was passionate to want to be with me and I didn't see, we didn't see anything wrong with the relationship. But all of my friends, who were also friends with Sue, came to me privately and even as a group, and in love said, Ralph, you can't let this go further. It's not right. We don't think this is a right path for you and this other young lady. My senior pastor called me into his office with a grave concern for me. And I couldn't understand what they saw as the problem because this was a person who loved God, who was a great prayer warrior, it seemed, who was passionate for God. What was the issue? But they were able to see things that I couldn't. That relationship did break off. And it was some time after that. Sue was already in our youth, in our college and career group. She had moved to Toronto from Brockville. And I'm so glad 
that God gave her the patience of Job to wait for me to get my common sense marbles intact. What was the issue? We know the verse that says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And we've always applied that as a youth pastor. I've preached it that if you want a, a, a successful life, make sure that your spouse is also a follower of Jesus. But it means more than that. It also includes in that the idea that make sure that whomever you are with is on the same track you're on. And the problem was that I could not see is that myself and this other young woman were, while they lo she loved God, I loved God, we were not on the same track as far as calling and ministry and a desire to serve God. Sue and I went to Bible college together. Our callings were the same. We were on the same track. And I am so glad today for those voices that spoke into my life because I needed to get steered away from something that may have been disastrous. And I'm so thankful today that God brought Sue into my life. And my friends, young people, God's going to bring people into your life that seem to have it all. But understand, if they're not on the same track with you, with God as you are, be careful. Watch out. Keep your eyes focused on God. Rick Warren puts it this way, being controlled by the opinions of others is a guaranteed way to miss God's purpose for your life. That's why we need godly counsel. That's why we need to get counsel from people who, tr who we trust to hear God themselves. And then finally, not only are we to be students of God's word, we're to use common sense, we're to listen to godly counsel, but finally, hearing God listens to authority. You may say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Hearing God does not mean that we forget the parental and spiritual leadership that God has placed over us. Our response to the authorities in our lives is the acid test whether we're truly willing to hear God. You see, the degree you submit to those in authority over you will be the limit of your submission to God. God has placed authorities in our lives. He has placed government authority. Young people, he's placed parents in authority. He's placed employers in in authority. He's placed leadership in the church in authority. And I know some of us don't like to hear that, but it must be said because each and every day, the verse that convicts me the most is that verse that says that those who teach the word of God will be judged more than all. And I know more than anything as I stand behind this podium that God is taking notes and he's taking note that what I'm teaching is going to be in congruence with his word, which I pray each and every moment, God, help me not to preach right Help me to preach your word because I'm also under his authority. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Titus 3, 1 and 2, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. Okay, pastor, just hold on a second. I get the, I, I get to be, re, be su subject to your, your parents. I get 
can understand the employer. I can understand some of these things. I'll even accept the church leadership. But come on, pastor. There are those in government that I just plain don't like or agree with. Well, are you, going to agree, are you going to argue with God who says he's placed them there? Notice what he says. Notice what Titus says. To submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. To slander no one. To avoid fighting. And to be kind always showing gentleness to all people. He doesn't say political parties or laws that we disagree with. And quite frankly, there are some laws that our government passes that make my head spin and wonder, where is the common sense? Several years ago, I was invited by Tim Schindel to be part of his national prayer network ministry and every three months we receive the names of politicians federally that we are to pray for and these prayers are printed and published for the politicians to read and to see and there have been more than once where a politician has been offered to me that I had to repent to God because I couldn't pray for them. I didn't like them. I didn't agree with the party they represented. I thought some of them were evil personified. And then the Holy Spirit brought conviction on my heart through his word. You're not to pray concerning their policies. You're, con you're called to pray for the people, for the person who have families, who have marriages, who have children that they're having difficulty with, some of them having health issues. One of them that I was called, that God, uh, or that I was instructed to pray for was a cabinet minister who I thought if I was going to pray anything, I would pray them out of office, but yet God showed me, God showed me what this person was going through personally. Totally turned my thoughts around as I began praying for the person. You may not agree with the politics and the policies. I don't either. But let us be men and women of God who will be an example of godliness as we walk in kindness and gentleness, that we don't slander people, but that our good works and faithfulness to Christ will demonstrate that we are people who follow Jesus. You can hear practically from God and it not be weak. We can obey our leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over our souls of those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be profitable to you. And here the writer uh, is talking about pastors, about elders. You know what? I am so thankful I pastor a church where I know people are hurting. I say that humbly. I say it confidently. But I want you to know that it does this pastor well. It does not build me up in pride, but it encourages me to keep going. Because there are some days I wonder. But I'm so thankful to this church and for the intercessors in this church that, that pray. And as you're praying, wait for God's timing. He'll bring it to pass. If you feel God has given you something to do, he will bring about the time it's to be done. And always check with your spouse. We've been together, Sue and I, for 37 years of ministry and marriage together. And there have
hasn't been a change that we have made that we have not consulted one another. Pray together. Serve together. Read God's word together. You can practically hear from God and not be here. A few weeks ago, I shared with you I like that one. <laughs> I like that one. I'm going to ask the team to come back and to lead us in a song of worship. And I shared with you a few weeks ago, and I've been giving it, and I've been giving homework in the communique, and I'll do it again this week. But I've been sharing with you some more. That as you are reading God's word and pray over God's word, that as you do, write down the scripture that God seems to be speaking to you about. What is the message that God is saying in that verse? Is it a message of obedience? Is it a message to repentance? And how is God calling you to pray based upon what you're reading and what you're hearing God? As they, as the worship team leaves, I'm going to invite us to stand. And Thank you for joining us today. If you would like prayer, or perhaps you would like to give to the Ministry of Highway, you can connect with us at hcfsydney.ca. Follow the links, and you will find uh, the contact information for our church, to reach a pastor, and we would be happy to serve you in whatever way we can. God bless, and we'll see you again next time.